All right, question show time. Your questions, my answers. Wherever you are, anyone on the channel, if a question pops into your brain, just write it down. I'll gather a bunch of them up and I'll answer them here. All right, let's get into it. Guru of technologies. You make awesome videos, but why do you have very less subscribers? I think mean, you must have more subscribers. Sad face, winky face, smiley face. Uh, that, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I mean, at this point, I think I just recorded episode 350 of The Guide to Space. I've done more than 50 of these question shows. Uh, you know, you definitely have to keep showing up every day and the subscribers show up a bit at a time. I crossed the 100,000 mark, I'm on my way to the 200,000 mark. But if there are channels that you think are underappreciated and you would like to help them get more subscribers, there's a couple of things that you can do for those channels. The first thing is click on the little notification bell so that you will get notified whenever a new video is released. In theory, uh, who knows how the algorithm really works, but if a lot of people are jumping in and they're watching these videos as quickly after the release, that's a signal to YouTube that the video is a good one. The other thing to do is to watch videos all the way through. YouTube is looking for uh, you know, watch time and they want to make sure that a video has a high retention rate. So if you find yourself skipping through parts of the video or ending a video early, that is a signal that YouTube takes to say, oh, people aren't really enjoying this video so much, we'll show this less often again than other videos. And then the last thing you can do is you can then after you finish watching one video, you can go and watch other videos on a channel. So if you come to a channel that you really like and you watch one video, and let's say for example they put a playlist at the end of that video, you can then go and watch some of the other videos in that playlist and that is a message that that creator is providing a lot of sort of on-site time, very sticky, to YouTube. And again, these are the kinds of signals that YouTube takes to uh, to sort of know which creator should be getting more subscribers and, and which should be getting, I guess, less. So again, click on the notification bell for any creators that you want to sort of find out right away when they release a new video. Watch their videos all the way through and when you finish watching one video, go and watch another video and another one and another one and all of them. Um, watch as many of their videos as much of the way through as you can and that will send all the messages to YouTube to say, this is a creator that I really like and I wish they would get more subscribers. Bazil Collard. Why does NASA never launch multiple times the same satellite and space telescope? Looks like they develop everything from the ground up each time. That is a great question and actually, you know, there were multiple copies of spacecraft made in the past. Like think about the Pioneers and the Voyagers and the Viking spacecraft. They were duplicates essentially of the same spacecraft. There was the twin Spirit and Opportunity rovers that were sent to Mars. And now there's Curiosity which is on Mars and the Mars 2020 rover is going and it's going to be kind of a copy. So if there is the same spacecraft that can be used multiple times, in many cases NASA will make a copy of the spacecraft, modify the kinds of the science payload, and send that to, to some location. But, and you can imagine sort of in the future as launch costs come down and that you get sort of componentization of spacecraft where a spaceship could be sent up or a, you know, a rocket could be sent up and send out a whole bunch of satellites and they all go off and explore say a different asteroid. But, in other cases, you've got like one very specific question that you're trying to ask. Like you want to map the background of, you know, the cosmic microwave background to a very high level of resolution. And there's like one instrument that'll do the job. And once you've built that, you kind of don't need another one. So sometimes there are going to be multiple spacecraft that are going to be able to sort of do the same job in different places. And sometimes you just need something custom made for the job. And I promise you every time NASA, when they sit down to plan this thing out, they're asking themselves these questions. They're constantly balancing and figuring out which things to keep and which things to throw away and what sort of mission plan makes the most sense for the kind of budget that they have. Joe Thai. Hey Fraser, you mentioned your binoculars are 15 by 70. What's the brand or model? I'm using uh, Celestron Sky Masters, Celestron binoculars, 15 by 75s, which means that they have a uh, 15 power and they have a 75 millimeter aperture on the sort of on the two parts of the binocular. And those are great for seeing the night sky and really being able to see a lot of sort of more subtle details, more stars. Look up at the Milky Way, you can see uh, globular clusters, you can see some of the nebulae, the moon planets. They're a great first thing and there's something really special about using binoculars over even just looking through a telescope that 
uh, sort of using two eyes at the same time is great. So if you have any interest in getting into astronomy whatsoever, start with a pair of binoculars. Uh, you know, they're not expensive. I think you can pick them up on Amazon for sale for like $75. They're not expensive. And there are other makers as well that do the same thing. So highly recommend astronomical binoculars. Jordan S.A. Why is repairing the reaction wheels not an option? All right, so we talk about reaction wheels quite a bit. Reaction wheels are these spinning sort of gyroscopes inside the spacecraft that they use to orient themselves. And, uh, you know, they spin up, and if you've got sort of three, di three dimensions of these gyroscopes, you can turn your spacecraft in kind of any orientation that you want. If you lose, most of them are equipped with four. If you lose one, then you're down to three. You can still turn yourself, but if you go down to two, then you can no longer orient yourself in all three axes. So when you think about the test mission, for example, the whole thing cost about $200 million to launch. When you think about the Hubble Space Telescope rescue missions, those cost in the order of like one and a half to $2 billion. And the, so do you go and send a mission to rendezvous with the TESS spacecraft, which costs a couple hundred million dollars, spend billions to replace its reaction wheels, or do you just launch another, I don't know, nine TESSs to account for the fact that it's broken. So this is always the case. Really Hubble is the only spacecraft that anyone's ever really thought about repairing in orbit for whatever went wrong. And it was sort of designed from the ground up to be repaired. But most other spacecraft, especially these ones like James Webb that are going on these really unusual trajectories, they're never gonna be able to be repaired. And if they break down, they break down and you have to launch another one is sort of the reality. Mr. Drew. Habitable exoplanets we find today may not be habitable now. Some are thousands of light years away and a lot could have happened by the time the light reaches us. Yeah, I guess a lot could happen, but it's only a couple of thousand years, right? I mean, you think about how long, say, the Earth has remained habitable. It's been habitable for a billion years. And um, how long human beings have been around for, say, 200,000 years in their modern form, a million years, hopefully will last longer. So even if the stars are several thousand light years away from us, I hope not a lot has changed. And in fact, a lot of the stuff that place, you know, that spacecraft like TESS are going to be finding are a lot closer to us. They're within dozens of light years. So hopefully, if we do find a habitable world, nothing too catastrophic has happened to them in the last dozen years. Eric Trafal. Great videos. TESS can use gyroscopes to reorient itself or another mechanism. Once again, uh, TESS is using reaction wheels in the same way that Kepler does, same way that Hubble does. Almost all the spacecraft out there use these reaction wheels. The kind of the other way is to have thrusters so you can sort of fire your thrusters and, and reorient yourself. And that works if you don't have to do a lot of course corrections, but if you're going to be changing all the time, like with telescopes where you want to sort of focus on one location in the sky and keep it keep track on it and then turn to another location you want to use reaction wheels and they've got four and so they've got one spare and I you know the joke that I always make is that they don't send enough reaction wheels maybe they should put six but you know reaction wheels are probably very heavy um, you know you costs are very tight and there's only, you know and they sort of hope that the reaction wheels will last out for the lifetime of the spacecraft but yeah Tesla's gonna use reaction wheels like Kepler margin fly what about exosunspots? How can they tell these apart from transiting planets? Right, so when you're using the transit method, you are looking at the brightness of the star. And so there's a lot of things that could impact the brightness of the star. You could imagine, um, as you said, a sunspot could brighten it up. There could be a cloud of dust. There could be some variability in the star itself that would change the brightness of the star. And so the way that astronomers sort of get rid of all those false positives is they track it over long periods of time. And what they're looking for is a brightening or a dimming that happens on a regular basis. So if you see a dimming every 13 days, then you know that a planet is passing in front of the star, as opposed to say big sunspots that would darken it, but they probably wouldn't return. So for all of these various methods, what matters is that you keep an eye on your target for as long as possible. And this is why searching for, say, another Earth is going to be such a challenge, is because, you know, when you think about the Earth, we go around the sun once every 365 days. So if you want to be able to spot another Earth around another star, you're going to be watching the star, you're going to see this dot go past it, and then you have to keep watching it for another 
365 days, you'll see it darken again, and then you have to maybe do it another year just to finally confirm that it's there. So we're gonna see uh, a lot of those smaller worlds around more sun-like stars are gonna take longer and longer for us to be able to recognize that they are indeed planets. And this is just part of the challenge. Charles E. Bright. Love this channel, learned a lot. When do you believe that we will get the first clear picture of a planet outside our solar system? Unfortunately, the best pictures that we have of planets outside our solar system right now are just a couple of pixels. There's really, we don't have any kind of resolution, even with the most powerful telescopes that we have today. And even when James Webb comes online, it's not gonna be able to get more than the same thing, a couple of pixels. Now, it's gonna be able to really tell the brightness of those pixels with a high degree of accuracy so you know, say, what the atmosphere is or what the planet is made of, but we're gonna need a really a quantum leap in technology before we can get to anything that is more detailed than that. So it's gonna be like, there's this idea of taking a spacecraft or a telescope out to about a thousand astronomical units away from the sun, where you can use the gravity of the sun as a natural lens to show exoplanets around another star. And in that case, you would be able to see objects as big as, say, mountains or even houses on other planets around other stars. But for us to be able to get a spacecraft all the way out to that distance is pretty crazy. So for now, we're not going to see much better for a long time. We're going to have to sort of use our imagination to think about what the world would actually look like. Christopher Blackman. Hey Fraser, how feasible is it that a probe could hitch a ride on Halley's Comet in 2062 if we're still here then, or would it even be worth trying? Thanks. I've had this question quite a bit come from people and the sort of the, this idea that we could hitch a ride on a comet and then we wouldn't have to use like a big speed boost. But remember that comets go on an elliptical orbit around the sun. Halley's Comet returns every, what is it, 79 years around the sun. Uh, it comes in and then goes back out and comes in and goes back out. And when it sort of goes back out, it pretty much just gets out to about the orbit of Pluto before it comes back in. Well, we can send spacecraft past the orbit of Pluto. Voyagers, Pioneers, New Horizons have all gone past the distance from us to Pluto. So, and remember that if you could actually catch up to Halley's Comet, you would have the velocity of Halley's Comet, right? And so you would be following the exact same orbit as of Halley's Comet, whether you tried to land on it or use it to get a speed boost. The way we get speed boosts are with gravitational slingshots. This is when we use the gravity of a giant planet like Jupiter or Saturn or even Earth to catch up to them in orbit and steal some of their orbital velocity to go faster out into space. And that's the way that you're able to get these speed boosts when you're trying to move around the solar system. Eric Thatcher. Hi Fraser, love the videos. In the 1980s cartoon Thundar the Barbarian, a runaway asteroid passes between the Earth and the Moon and causes world havoc. Could this really happen? Can an asteroid move between the Earth and the Moon? Uh, yes, happens all the time. In fact, at the time that I'm recording this video, it happened like a week ago. It happens several times a year, depending on the size of the asteroid. You know, a house, you'll often see these articles, a house-sized asteroid passed between the Earth and the Moon, you know, came out of nowhere, surprising everyone. So yeah, this absolutely happens all the time. And as you see, we don't have any havoc caused from this close flyby. The havoc would happen if it hit the Earth. But it's a pretty big distance between the Earth and the Moon, and these kind of flybys can happen all the time. Kate Ern Dragham. I have a question. Could there be another galaxy really close to us that might hit us in the next 100 million or so years, but it's on the opposite side of the Milky Way compared to where we are, so we can't see it yet? Well, there is a galaxy that is on its way to crash into us, and that is Andromeda. And we can see it happening very clearly, and it's going to take about 5 billion years to, for us to collide. And we used to think that Andromeda was a lot more massive than the Milky Way, and now it seems like they're roughly the same mass, and so they're going to sort of pass each other, and they're going to sort of spray each other apart, and they're going to, the pieces are going to come back together, and eventually they're going to form this elliptical galaxy. And this seems to happen on a regular basis when we look out into the universe and we see these galaxies colliding with each other. Now, there is this thing called the Great Attractor, and it is hidden behind the core of the Milky Way. It's definitely not going to happen, and we and sort of all, a bunch of other galaxies are kind of falling into this. And what that seems to be is just a 
over density of mass in the universe. Like there's more galaxies that away, and that where that over density is happens to be on the other side of the Milky Way. So we can't see it directly, but we can, you know, with infrared light, we can actually see most of it happening. We can see sort of galaxies sliding towards it. So uh, no, there's not going to be anything coming at us from the other side of the Milky Way uh, at that kind of speed and within that amount of time frame. But you know, if you play the motions of all of the galaxies in our local group forward, millions, billions, trillions of years, who knows what kind of shenanigans the whole system is going to get up to. All right. Thanks, everyone. That wraps up this week's uh, question show. As always, wherever you are, if you have question pops in your brain, just write it down anywhere on the channel. I'll gather a bunch of them up and answer them here. We'll see you next week.